drought, fire, food security. These are some of the catastrophes facing California in this generation and the next. It is imperative we do everything we can to mitigate these disasters now. Let's look at the Permaculture Neighborhood Center as an example. This one-third acre lot in the small town of Sebastopol, California has been transformed from an asphalt and gravel parking lot into an ecological food forest in three years. Soil fertility systems, roof water catchments, perennial and annual food production. These are just some of the examples modeled here. Take a look. Vegetables, fruit, nuts, medicine, herbs. How can we pack that into a sustainable homestead garden right in the middle of suburbia that can provide for multiple families and potentially even provide for the entire neighborhood? That's why we've called this place the Permaculture Neighborhood Center because we believe that developing a neighborhood center based on ecological principles, a neighborhood center that can not only support the food and medicine needs of the community but be a gathering place to learn about how we take urban lots, asphalted, cemented, pesticide-ridden lots, and turn them into edible oases. One of the key features here at the Permaculture Neighborhood Center is catching and storing water in the landscape. California being a state known for its water scarcity, and what we want to show the world is that we can have water abundance just by design and the way we work with the earth and the way we work with water. When we purchased the property, we discovered that the city of Sebastopol actually made our neighbors plumb all of the runoff off of two houses in a total of half an acre of area. All that runoff was plumbed through an eight inch pipe, which went on our property and out to the storm drains. And what we did was we, we put a six inch gate valve that allows us to control how much water flows out to the storm drains or how much flows through the T that we installed that brings that water right here high in the landscape on this property. So this is a contour swale that I'm standing in. What that means is that this is a ditch that we've dug on contour. So every point here is at the same elevation. It fills up this contour ditch like a bathtub, allowing that water to sit and slowly infiltrate into the ground. As that water infiltrates into the ground, it actually creates a water plume or a water lens that slowly moves down slope. And that water lens, our fruit trees, our nut trees, our forest trees can tap right into and use for their water needs. And you can see here a nice big red raspberry Delicious fruit right from the garden. It doesn't get better than that. Now a long skinny ditch is much more effective at spreading water over a distance, which is mostly desirable in most situations. But if you're in a small space and you don't have the space to run a long contour ditch, then a more circular type catchment system might be more appropriate. A circular shape has the most volume to surface area. So if you want to maximize the amount of water that's going to infiltrate in a small space, a circular structure is going to be much more effective in terms of volume and quantity than a long skinny ditch would. So in this way, we're slowly stepping the water down through the property, catching it and infiltrating it as much as possible every step of the way as we start moving down slope towards the street. So anytime you have an element, be it a catch basin or a fence. You want to have as many possible functions for that element as possible. The reason why we built this fence in the first place was so that we could close gates and keep children out of the pond area. The second reason is we use this fence as a way to grow food. So an espalier is a unique way to train fruit trees. Not only can you train a tree now in a wall type shape, but it also creates a large amount of surface area so that tons of light is, are, is going to penetrate and what that does is give us a larger yield generally across a surface area, a smaller, uh, a, a larger amount of surface area. So you increase your yield per, per surface area of a plant, of a tree, and you also keep it tucked into a wall so you can use a small space 
and you turn a fence into an edible wall. Each one of these apple trees has six different types of apples grafted onto them. And each variety harvest at a different time of the year. So essentially both of these trees will have apples on them for approximately two months out of the year. So the more we can extend our harvest time, our harvest season, that benefits us in a couple ways. One, we don't get a, a glut of one kind of fruit all at one time that's really hard to process. It's also really nice to have apples more than one time of the year. So when you're able to extend your harvest season, now I've got apples for two months. And of course, apples store really well. So actually I have apples for about eight months if we store them in the right way. It's beautiful, it's functional, and it's edible. One of our experiments here is how can we create fences and structures using living trees? We want to pack as many different varieties of edibles in the small space as possible, but we also want to delineate space. We want to create different areas, almost like outdoor rooms, that the kids can play or the different members of the community can have privacy or places to party, various functions. So one way we do that is what we call a Belgian fence. But what they developed was this way of actually grafting together two trees of the same type. These are two peach trees and we have uh, um, seven different varieties of peach trees that all harvest at different times in the har during the harvest season. So we extend our harvest season here. And what happens when you scarify or scar the cambium layer, the outside bark layer of a tree and you place it together and graft them together they will actually grow into each other, creating structural integrity. We've only pleached the first layer, but you can also, when the branches are large enough, graft another layer higher up in the horizon of the treescape. Probably by next year, we'll be able to take the tape off and see how well they've fused together. But it's gonna work really well. This whole entire ecological garden is based on a vertical stacking principle. So when we want to pack a lot of production in a small space, planting in vertical layers. So this is also what we call a food forest or an edible forest garden. On the north side of this property, we have all of our tallest trees. So we've created a multi-layered system with the polonia tree as our tallest canopy layer. That tree has huge heart-shaped leaves and produces an immense amount of biomass. When you want to create an ecological garden or a food forest, you want to grow as much of your biomass, your mulching needs as possible. Mulch is organic matter that breaks down into healthy soil and suppresses weeds while also maintaining moisture in the soil horizon. And as we move down from the polonia tree, we have olive trees, we have butterfly bush, then we have fig trees. So the types of plant communities that we work here in a permaculture garden, edible forest garden, is we focus on useful plants. Plants that can provide food or medicine or that can attract beneficial insects. Plants that can maybe build soil and help feed the microorganisms in the soil. But we also put them together in communities that we call plant guilds. Now, some of them are based on annual vegetable crops, cherries, plums, figs, olive trees, kiwi, nectarines, peaches, and underneath those upper canopy edible trees are a whole variety of other edibles and medicinals, such as strawberries, aster, and milkweed, oregano, asparagus, and comfrey. The whole goal is how can we support the non-human community with our planting systems at the same time providing the basic needs of the human community. Now sometimes people ask when they see our gardens, they see plants really packed in close together. And sometimes people ask, well how do you maintain a garden like that? Well, so what I want to show you is the number one way to maintain a food forest garden. And essentially you chop it and then you drop it. Right here we have one of our most incredible mineral accumulating plants. This is called comfrey. 
and it accumulates many, many different kinds of minerals from deep down in the soil where other plants can't reach it. And as it brings it up into its leaves and its tissue, it makes that, those minerals accessible when the leaves decompose. It's also an incredible medicinal plant and you can also create a comfrey feed, a liquid fertilizer. These beautiful flowers are, attract bees and pollinators. So it's an insectary, it's a mineral accumulator, it's a medicinal, it's an edible. Most people are afraid to plant this in the garden because they're worried that it'll take over and comfrey does have a tenacious way of growing in the garden. But it also produces an incredible, incredible amount of biomass, of mulch, of organic material that when we harvest, we can turn into healthy soil. So in that one motion that took me about five seconds, I've covered my soil with a nutrient rich mulch, which will keep moisture in the ground, suppress weeds, and feed the microorganisms in the soil, which build that humus and create a living biomass in the soil that feeds our plants. Everything drinks water. All of your beneficial insects need water to survive. And many birds, as well as incredible animals, organisms that, we, that might manage pests in our garden, like frogs, salamanders, lizards, and snakes, all need water to drink. Water has the properties of thermal mass. Absorb heat from the air during the day when the sun is out. And at nighttime, when it starts to cool down, that mass, in this case being water, radiates that heat into the air. Now as that heat gets radiated into the air, it warms the space around the entire pond. This is what we call microclimate moderation. And ponds are incredible at doing that. What that means for us is that we can plant a whole variety of plants around this that might be a little more frost sensitive, might need a little more warmth during cold winter nights. And the pond will help provide that warmth for them. Another aspect of the pond, it actually reflects light. So when the sun is out, light's being reflected off the surface of the water, and that reflective light can help us ripen fruit. Ripen fruit on peaches, ripen fruit on nectarines, and offer a nice sunny light area for all different varieties of plants that might enjoy that extra light. All ponds that have fish need some kind of oxygen. We live right next to a busy highway, which produces a lot of noise pollution. So when you're in a loud kind of cityscape, uh, the sound of falling water can completely drown the sound of cars and trucks, fire engines. So we keep it on so we can feel like we're in our natural space. So this oven is built out of clay, sand, and straw. All natural materials that have been harvested locally. What you do is you build a fire inside here. And that fire will heat up all of the clay, all of the earth inside the oven and retain that heat. And generally we like to get the oven up to at least 650 degrees. This oven can go above 800 degrees before we start cooking pizzas directly on the fire brick in here. The other benefit is that it actually starts, heats up the space. So if it's a cold, rainy day, we can still be cooking out here. What we do is run a copper pipe through the inner wall of the cob oven, and we have this funnel here. And once the oven is hot, we pour water into the top of this funnel. And as the water goes through that copper pipe, it actually heats up, and it comes out this end almost boiling. This cob oven has given us such joy and fun out here in the in the landscape. It's pretty normal for us to cook at least 10 or 12 pizzas every time we have a party. About a third of our whole roof space drains into this tank and some other tanks that we'll see here in a moment. It's about 12,000 gallons that flows through this system and we have 4,500 gallons of storage. But a really important part of being able to catch rainwater is having some sort of pre-filter. Because in between storms, especially here in California, you can have a buildup of dust and dirt and various things on the roof that you don't necessarily want in your tank. Some might call it a first flush, some might call it a Brazilian ball valve filter. But essentially what it is is this large chamber. And so the water that comes off the roof of the house, first thing it does is it flows into this chamber first. Well, inside this pipe is a four inch ball. 
that floats in the water. So as this chamber fills up with water, that ball starts to rise inside the chamber. And it rises and it rises and it rises. And when the ball hits the top, it shuts the, the chamber off. So meaning the water from the roof doesn't enter this filter anymore and it goes right into the tank. So you have this entire, which is a fair amount of volume, this entire chamber, this whole filter to catch any kind of potentially dirty water before it enters the tank. And it's all quite automatic, or in a permaculture design, we call it relinquish power. As much as possible, any system that we design, if we can design it in such a way that we can relinquish power to the system, we can allow it to do its thing, it's self-organized, self-maintained as much as possible, that reduces our, our energy needs, allows us to be productive in other places. So once this chamber is full, it fills our first tank, and this first 3,000 gallon tank then overflows into our next tanks. So all winter long, here in California, we have a type of storm season where we might have storms for two weeks and then it might be sunny for two weeks. So during those sunny dry spells, I'll drain half of my tanks, knowing that they'll fill up in the next storm. And that's how you can extend the actual amount of water that you've harvested. So I've probably harvested closer to 15,000 gallons of water in total this year, even though I only have 4,500 gallons of storage. We're just gonna show you a very simple passive way to use storm-caught rainwater to irrigate the landscape. We're just using this very temporary black pipe that will move as soon as we're done. And we've run this pipe to a contour swale. So again, we're talking about a ditch that is dug on contour and allows the water to fill up like a bathtub right here in the landscape. By doing that, you can have immediate water infiltration and irrigation. And then the secondary piece is this water is going to sit, infiltrate in the ground and actually feed all the trees here in the front part of our landscape. So this is the premise, this is the pattern. This is the way we layer our edible forest gardens. And here in Sebastopol, California, we have a two year budding model. And in probably about three more years, at, five, at a five year point since installation, we'll start seeing a huge surplus of food and medicine and mulch and soil building and water catchment that will come out of this site that will support not only this community, but the entire community of Sebastopol in our neighborhood.